Good morning and welcome to church this morning. And what a beautiful day outside, like we see the sunshine, we've had the rain, and uh, hopefully we'll just keep going like that because we need the rain too, along with sunshine. Um, as settlers, we respectfully acknowledge that Knox United Church Durham is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg Nation, the people of the Three Fires Confederacy, known as the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Potawatomi Nations. We give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen, the Chippewas of Nahwash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. Please join me for the lighting of the Christ candle. The light in all of life, shine bright light, shine upon me, filling me with your warmth and peace. Please join me for the call to worship. Early in the morning we gather at the edge of heaven, finding the gates flung wide open by the one who welcomes all. Early in the morning, we come to this holy place of worship to be touched by the one who offers us grace and love. Early in the morning, we worship God who adopts us into the family to be filled by the one who would pour us out in service to the world. Let's pray together. God who keeps promises, every word you have spoken of hope found in the depths of life of healing surprising our pain, of grace jumping rope with children will all come true even when our stubbornness deafens us to your whispers. Jesus who sows seeds, every hope you have for us of kindness never ending, of persistent patience, of sacrificial service, can be found even when others cannot see them in us. Spirit who leads us into life, every dream you have of peace becoming our best friend, of joy bubbling from our hearts, of strangers welcomed as kin will happen even when we insist on living out our fantasies. Behind us, under us, beside us, over us, you are ever and always with us, God in community, holy in one. And so we lift our prayers to you today. Amen. The hymn is, Come Now, Almighty King.
hiding in the cobweb corners of our lives, we hope God cannot find us and see how we truly speak and act. But God's light of righteousness shines on us so that we might find comfort, hope, forgiveness. Let us confess our sins together, saying, I've tried to hide from your searching gaze, love's delight. I've climbed mountains and burrowed deep into earth's caverns. I've fled to the farthest edges of my soul and longed to sail in my fears to the dark side of the moon. And wherever I go, you are waiting for me. Even in the dimmest corners of my heart, your light is able to find me. Lost, I am found. Afraid to speak of my sinfulness, you hear my stumbling words before I shape them in my mind. Unable to help myself, you redeem me through the gracious love of Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior. Amen. In sorrow so deep we cannot find our way out, God cradles us in comfort. In moments so dark we stumble over ourselves, God lights our, the way. In joy which cascades into our souls, God fills us with healing. Even when we cannot see it, God's hope is all around us, surrounding us with peace and healing. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen.
come on up, come on up, don't worry, I got a job for you. How are you at lighting candles? You don't know? I'll show you. I'm going to tell you a little story about candles. First of all, this was many, many years ago when I was much younger. Somebody in the church told me there's actually a proper way to light a candle. There is. First of all, you know what this is? It's a lighter, right. And what's it say on that? Right there. Bic. Right. I was told the last thing you should ever do in a church is flick your bic, but I'm going to do it now. Doesn't want to work. That's why. Here we go. Lights a candle. But that's not how you lit a candle in church. You lit a candle in church using this. You know what that is? It's a candle lighter. It's seriously, it's what it's called. It's called a candle lighter. And it does two things. It does, well, it does two things. Just wait. It has this piece, this wick. Okay? It's also got a snuffer. You can see the wax around there. So what you do, and this is how it works. I'm going to light this like that. Poof! It lights up, right? Okay. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to snuff that candle right out. All right. Now, something happened this morning, and I don't know why or how, but we got two candles we have to light this morning. So I'd like you to help me light these candles. Come on down. All right. And by the way, I didn't get your name. Sorry? What's your name? Jelena. Jelena? Okay, Jelena. What I'd like you to do, I've got to feed this up a little bit. See, see how it's, it's kind of tricky. It likes to burn down. All right, trick number one. I'd like you to take hold of it. And you've got to hold it up here because it slides back in. So we're going to do this, move it right oh, put it, keep. We're going to move it right up to this wick. We're going to do that. All right, we're going to come over here. All right. And we're going to do this. Same thing. There we go. All right, now, what do you do? There's a little trick. All right? Like that. You draw that back in and you slide it out. And the reason you do that is that if you don't, this will get all caught in here and it causes a mess. It's awful. It's awful. Now, all of a sudden, you now know how to light candles in church. You never flick your bick. You use a candle lighter or another candle because that way it's quieter. It's also neater. So, I'll tell you, do you ever light candles at home? You used to. Okay. Now, because the same things that you, I just showed you, you can do at home. You light a candle. But you can light a candle off a side candle. I'll show you a little trick here. A side candle, yes. I can take this and I can just go like that. And that's a safe way to carry a candle. So if you have other candles to light, you, light it, you just tip it sideways and off it goes. You can move it around. And then you go, here, you do that. Can you put that candle out for me? There we go. That's it. There's a whole bunch of science there that's in behind that, but I'm not going to go into that right now. But that's how you light candles in church. So, there we go. And do you know what the candles really symbolize? They symbolize God's presence. God's here with us. God's all around us, even in fire. Okay? All right. So let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks that you can be with us, that we see the signs of your presence around us, the smiles on people's faces, the warm handshakes, and yes, the candles. Thank you, God, for your presence here. Amen. Okay, are we going to Sunday school? No, guess what? You go back, you can go back to sit down back there, or right there. The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 to 9, and 18 to 23. The parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. 
and he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on a path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. If you have ears, hear. The parable of the sower explained, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root but endures only a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of his age and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I came across the story of a hospital chaplain, and I think it has some bearing on the lesson that we just heard from the Gospel of Matthew. A hospital chaplain received a call to a dying man's bedside. Upon entering the room where a, a beautiful old man was taking his last breaths, his son introduced himself. Hi, I'm the oldest son. My name's John. Nice to meet you, John, the chaplain replied. My heart goes out to you in this sad and holy moment. John then introduced his dad, saying, Well, I'm pleased to report that dad's been saved for 27 years now, thank God, so there's nothing to worry about here. The chaplain paused for a moment. And they thought, but didn't say, as a good chaplain does, I've only come to know God's saving work in the present tense as something that happens continuously in me. But, like a good chaplain, they replied appropriately with a genuine Alleluia. John continued, Pastor, we're all set here. The reason I sent for you is because you may want to pay a visit next door. That poor man, he's and his voice dropped to a whisper, he's unsaved, unchurched. You know what I mean? Well, the chaplain was quite sure what he meant. I mean, it couldn't be mistaken. And what was really going on was the chaplain was being encouraged to go and visit the man next door and show him Jesus so that this guy could get his ticket punched to go to heaven. John called him unsaved or unchurched. But the chaplain had a hunch it might have meant something else like Muslim, Presbyterian, or even went to church but never really liked it. And the chaplain, being a good chaplain, did, not, did go to the next room, but not by the most direct route. And he did not want to indicate that he was following the um, directions of the certain son. What the chaplain discovered when they entered the room was a, a person very much at peace, surrounded by loved ones, who, would dis who he, he, the chaplain discovered had given a wonderful life of service to the community and to others. What the chaplain saw and said they would never forget was as they stepped back from the room, a very revealing picture was present between the two 
hospital rooms. In some hospitals, and I, I've seen this actually myself in some hospitals, I think the, 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 one of the newest hospitals on, in Ontario is designed this way. There is a, a door here, but there are two doors at an angle. So if you stand in this doorway, you can see into two rooms. The patients can't see each other or interact, but it's a form of isolation. And it's, it's kind of interesting to see. But if you stand back, you can look into both rooms. And this is what the chaplain saw from that central doorway. What the chaplain saw were two families. Each one showing deep love for their, 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 their loved one, their, their, their member of their family who was not to be long for this world. Two families with very different worldviews surrounding their loved one with expressions of pure love and affection. As the chaplain said, the beauty on either side of the wall was, was similarly striking and holy, and it was hard to imagine God feeling anything but glorified by it all. The truth is, there are many ways, many different ways, God's saving work can be made manifest in people's lives. John's eldest, John's eldest son, John the eldest son, I'm sorry, his idea of salvation may have been rooted in something like the, the parable that I just read, where if seeds fall on good soil, they will, they will be nurtured and they will develop, and they will do good things. It's kind of like, well, the rest of the soil is, is, is not good. It's outside, but the good soil are the insiders. So you've got two groups. You've got the, the, the poor soil and the good soil, and very much a difference between them. And the story depicts the kingdom as the work of a good sower who, whose work is compromised by weeds and rocks and poor soil. But don't forget, it's not just the soil that matters because weeds can grow up anywhere. They really can. And in fact, in another version of this parable, this same parable in Scripture. The, the, the sower's slaves notice weeds among the, the, the wonderful um, stalks of wheat and ask if they should remove them. And the, the uh, householder, the sower, says, no, if you go after the weeds, you'll uproot the, the wheat as well. So just leave them. We'll deal with that at harvest. And I am sure any farmers or retired farmers, oh, I'm sorry, that's an oxymoron. A farmer never retires. Any farmers in the, in the congregation will say, what on earth is the preacher talking about? You don't let weeds grow up among the crop. That's not good farming. Any weeds that are present reduce the quality of the grain and the yield and all those things. So, and you make less money on the crop. So why on earth would you let the weeds grow up along with the, the wheat? That's how we farm today. I was looking out the, from the pulpit in Crawford and I could see straight in front of me the tracks of the spraying machine that had gone over the grain field. At some point in the near future that will be harvested and there will be very few weeds. And I see this all up and down Highway 6 as I drive to and from Durham. The tracks of the spray machines across the fields. You know, the ones with the big wheels that drive slowly on the shoulder of the road and raise great clouds of dust and create great traffic jams behind them and people get impatient and pass unsafely. But God's ecology is different. In God's world, in fact, seeds and weeds, wheat and weeds, tares and weeds, to use the old term, can grow together. 
And it kind of helps us understand the image that is present in this parable. They grow side by side. They intertwine. And sometimes you can't tell the difference. And how do you deal with the weeds without uprooting the good growth? So the separation happens at harvest time when angels will reap and gather the good wheat into the barn and discard the rest. I learned that's true in my own life and in my own garden. After years of ripping out what I thought were weeds in the garden and bearing the sadness of my wife, who told me those were flowers I had taken out, I got a plant identification app on my smartphone. Like that. Works perfectly. And you may recall at the uh, joint service between Crawford and Durham, I used that and to identify birds that were around the, uh, the park. And we could hear and identify the robins and the chickadees and all those lovely um, other birds that were present. It's a lot of fun. Well, you can do the same with plants and weeds. And what I have learned is to be quiet. Let the garden grow. And at some point, identify the weeds. But don't harvest them until I've consulted with my wife and had a look at them through the plant app. And then, and only then, will I venture a guess between a weed and a flower and remove what she tells me she wants removed. We can all see weeds in our church, in our community. But maybe we shouldn't make it our business to separate the wheat and the weeds. As Jesus, Jesus workers, we can help nurture and feed and cultivate the good growth that he has planted, the seeds on the good soil, if you will, by sharing the good word and doing our best to love and heal and seek the lost like he did. I mean, that, that's, that's not hard to do. But there's another point to the parable. The church itself is also a tangle of of wheat and weeds, good and bad, good soil, bad soil, all wrapped up together. And the imagery of the parable helps us see what to look for and how to look for and what to do. What to do with what we see. My wife is doing a, a very interesting project you know, in sound in that she is um, doing interviews with people who are currently unhoused or are very much at risk of being unhoused and it's called in their own words. And one of the things she asked of them is what would you hope for? What would you hope for? And one of the answers she received recently has stuck with her, and I share it with you. It's two words. This is a person who probably you would wonder about or not, but they are unhoused. And they looked at my wife, this person looked at my wife and said, be kind. Think about that. Be kind. Be kind to each other, be kind to others who are not like us, who are different, who are other, who are on the edges, who are somehow people who we might not encounter. Be kind. Because that's the kind of good that Jesus wants us to plant and spread and nurture in this world. There's plenty of work to do. Don't kid yourself. Plenty of work. But I don't believe it is picking and separating. That's the job for somebody else. Our job? Loving each other. Being kind to each other. Caring for each other. And sharing the good news of God every day.
Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks. We give thanks that you have shown us this new way. You rejoice in all the love that is shared and all the caring that is given to our community. May that be upon our hearts in kindness and in peace. In Jesus' name, amen. The hymn is God Whose Farm is All Creation. Now let us present our tithes and our offerings for the work of the Lord. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. they are, the broken, the homeless, those without hope, those in need of justice, you are with them, O God. Not just with them, but healing them, caring for them, feeding them, and sustaining them with all the gifts offered to you by so many, including ours. Receive, bless, and accept these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, we thank you that you are closer to us than our next breath, that you know us better than we know ourselves, that your love for all of us and for all your children is deeper and higher and broader than we can ever imagine. We thank you for all your blessings to us and that you are close to us in all your joys and sorrows. We thank you for Jesus Christ that his life of care and mercy for those in need, his preaching of forgiveness and his death and resurrection speak to us of your love for the world and for each one of us. Hear our prayers for the church and the world. May our church be a place of mercy and forgiveness. May all who are distressed find in the Christian community peace and comfort which you offer all people. We thank you for those who supply us with the necessities of life. Especially today, we pray for farmers and all who bring us our food. We pray for fair trading systems to ensure that those who produce food are given a just reward for their labors. We pray for those in our communities who struggle to feed their families 
and for an economic system which is fair to them too. We pray for doctors, both those who look after our bodies and those who tend minds. We thank you for all who work in health care, especially at this time of stress on the health service. We pray for all who are ill, who have long-term ill health, for those who suffer from pain in their bodies and those who suffer in mind and spirit. Bring them healing and a better quality of life. We pray for all victims of war and violence and those driven from their homes because of hatred or uprooted, because of, uprooted by poverty to seek new lives elsewhere. May your people always be welcoming to those who are new among us, even if they are very different from us. May those who claim to be Christians never stoke up hatred and division in our communities. We pray for those who have been recently bereaved, for those who mourn for loved ones long gone but not forgotten, and for those who feel that they have lost something else important in their life, a sense of belonging, an opportunity to deny, a road not taken. May, all, may they all know that they can never be far from your love. We pray for leaders in our community and in our nation and around the world. Give them wisdom. Keep them honest. And may they care for all the people whom they are called to serve. Hear us as in silence we remember people and situations which are close to our hearts today. Faithful God, may we all keep close to you as you are always close to us, looking for ways to nurture the coming of your kingdom and always faithful to our Savior Jesus Christ in whose spirit we bring these prayers. This we pray in the name of Jesus who showed us his way in these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The hymn is For Beauty of Prairies. Later in the morning, we will scatter as we go into the lonely places where your children gather for hope, our God, 
Now, later in the morning, we leave this place of worship to find the empty places of forgetfulness and fill them with your justice, our brother. Now, later in the morning, we will leave, be, leave these behind to search for our siblings in life and faith and expand our awareness of your family, our spirit. So go. Go into the fields. Go into the roads. Go into the, the, the places in this world where there is love, bringing love, bringing hope, bringing peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.